Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Nelson, and I'm Chief of Development for the Army Heritage Center Foundation, and thank you for attending. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Sorry for the technology problems. Uh, these things are, are, uh, uh, are often difficult, and uh, hopefully you were able to get the gist of that film, which was uh, there when Joe uh, received the Boots on the Ground Award from the Foundation uh, three years ago. Allow me to just read a, a bio of, uh, of, of Joe. Joe Galloway, one of America's premier war and foreign correspondents, for a half a century, he's, uh, he's been known and, and recently retired as the senior military correspondent for Knight Rider. Before that, uh, he was a special consultant to General Colin Powell at the State Department. In 2013, he was sworn into service as a special consultant to the Vietnam War 50th anniversary commemorative project, which is ran by the Secretary of Defense. He is also a permanent consultant to Ken Burns's Florentine Films and was instrumental in, in a big part of making the documentary history film of, of, of uh, the Vietnam War that PBS broadcast in 2016. Joe's from Texas. And he spent 22 years as a foreign and war correspondent and bureau chief for UPI, United Press International, and 20 years as a senior editor and senior writer for U.S. News and World Report. Over the years, Joe served uh, in assignments in Japan and Indonesia, three years as the bureau chief for UPI in Moscow. He also served four tours as a war correspondent in Vietnam and covered the 1971 India-Pakistan War, and a half a dozen other combat operations. Uh, in the 90s, uh, Joe was uh, covered the Desert uh, Shield Desert Storm, being embedded with the 24th, uh, 24th Infantry Division in the assault into Iraq. He also covered the Haiti insurrection and trips into uh, the wars uh, of Iraq in 2003 through 2006. It was the late General Schwarzkopf who met Galloway in Vietnam and said um, that he's the finest cor combat correspondent our of our generation, a soldier's reporter and a soldier's friend. Many of you know Joe through his work with Lieutenant General Howard Moore. Uh, he wrote the, they could wrote the national bestseller, We Were Soldiers Once and Young which was made into that critically acclaimed movie, one of my favorite movies, We Were Soldiers, starring Mel Gibson. He also uh, uh, was, was, the book was fortunate enough to sell 1.2 million copies worldwide and is still selling. Joe also co-authored Triumph Without Victory, the, the history of the Persian Gulf, and uh, did another book with uh, General Moore called We Were Soldiers, uh, still a journey back to the battlefields of Vietnam. He's going to tell you at the end about a, a book that he's recently written, and I'm excited uh, to, to, to be reading that. Joe has been picked as a, a leading uh, uh, military history historian, and the 10 greatest books ever written uh, was uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. In May of 98, this is impressive, Joe was decorated with the Bronze Star Medal for V for uh, rescuing wounded soldiers under fire in Idrang Valley in 1965. Uh, it's the only time that a Medal of Valor uh, has been awarded by the United States Army f to a civilian in actions in combat. There are so many things that Joe's been uh, uh, awarded and uh, presidential awards for the arts of the Vietnam Veterans Association. Uh, he's been recognized uh, with the 2011 Doughboy Award. Um, and uh, among other things, Joe was a recipient uh, of an honorary doctorate degree from Norwich University. And, uh, and, and I first met Joe in 2002 when he received his honorary doctorate from Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh, New York. I heard him speak there and was honored to be part of the crowd. He lives in North Carolina now with his wife, Dr. Grace Galloway. Please welcome. Oh, one more thing. Uh, please use your question and answer uh, box for asking questions. And at the end of the presentation, you can type them all along 
I'll start uh, answering or providing those questions directly to Joe at the end of this presentation. Don't use the chat, use the question and answer. Thank you so much and enjoy the presentation. Joe, it's all yours. Thank you, welcome aboard everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere. You've been to as many wars as I have and been shot at as much without effect. Uh, someone asked at the beginning if that cl film clip was from the movie We Were Soldiers, and no, it was not. It was 17 minutes of silent color film shot by two army sergeants on the battlefield at landing zone x-ray during the fight. And uh, I saw those guys when I arrived, they were laying flat on the ground and occasionally when it would quieten down, they would get up and shoot a little bit of film. Uh, and, you know, you would think that they would have been congratulated, promoted, awarded for going onto the battlefield and capturing that film. Nope. They were, in fact, reprimanded because of the graphic nature of the film they shot in the aid station, where, where uh, the, the battalion surgeon was doing tracheotomies in the dirt on wounded soldiers and saving their lives. And uh, uh, so these two guys, Sergeant Shiro and, and I can't remember the other one's name, they're both deceased now. Uh, they captured that film and uh, I, I wanted you to know that that was the real deal, not the movie. <clears throat> it's uh, the 30th of April 2020 and it is 45 years since the fall of Saigon the fall of South Vietnam. Uh, and uh, it's a chilling anniversary. Uh, those of us who were in Vietnam for much of the war uh, hated to see it in that way. Hated to see the United States walk away from our allies however hapless some of them may have been and however corrupt some of them may have been, uh, they were our allies. <clears throat> and uh, I remember when I first came to Vietnam in April of 1965, a UPI colleague of mine took me along to an appointment with the South Vietnamese uh, general, uh, Win Chan T, who was the I Corps warlord. Uh, he ran the show in that part of South Vietnam and, uh, and a pretty tough dude. And we go in, I think it's going to be drink some tea and shake his hand. And instead, he leans forward and gets pretty close. And he says to me, Are you Americans going to stay the course? You're coming in here and you are taking over this war we have fought for the last 20 years and, and you're pushing us aside and that's fine, but are you going to stay the course? He said, because if you're going to cut and run at the end, you're going to leave with your helicopters being shot up and it's going to be my men shooting at you if you run. Uh, and I, you know, my jaw dropped. I, I said, sir, I, I don't make American policy. I'm just a reporter. And he said, well, tell them what I said. T uh, was later uh, arrested by uh, General Key and uh, Key was going to shoot him, and uh, uh, my old friend General Sam Wilson persuaded Key to let T go into exile in the USA. 
and he lived out his life running a restaurant in in uh, Roslyn in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, that that's an aside and a long answer to a question. Uh, I'm really here to talk about three combat leaders: Hal Moore, Barry McCaffrey, and Norm Schwarzkopf. Uh, and it's appropriate on this anniversary that those three leaders learned their trade in the infantry in Vietnam. Moore was a battalion commander and then a brigade commander in the 1st Cavalry Division 65-66. Barry McCaffrey uh, served a tour as an advisor and then as a company commander captain in the second of the seventh cavalry in the first cavalry division he was severely wounded in combat uh went through 27 surgeries on his left arm to keep it so that he could stay in the army and of course went on to command the 24th division in uh, desert storm uh, and rose to four stars, uh, Southcom commander, and then uh, drug czar for the White House for a time. Norm Schwarzkopf was a captain and then a major in Vietnam as an advisor to the South Vietnamese Parachute Battalion. I met him, he was a brand new major. I met him in uh, the Central Highlands in uh, the summer of 1965. And he was a very angry, unhappy but battalion advisor. He had been with his Arvin Battalion at Duco Special Forces Camp and uh, they had uh, had some serious fights with the North Vietnamese and taken a lot of casualties. And, and Norm told me one day, he's on the radio, there are American helicopters flying over and he's begging them to stop by the camp and pick up his Arvin wounded and, and they wouldn't. Uh, he took the battalion and, and marched them out of Duco to play coup. <clears throat> they could not take the main road. All the bridges had been blown by the, uh, by the Vietnamese, uh, the VC and the North Vietnamese. So they were on a dirt road through the hills and mountains coming down to play coup. And uh, I went out with a uh, bunch of tanks and, uh, and 173rd Airborne troops. And we hooked up with them halfway along and, and escorted them on into Pleiku. Uh, Norm came back as a battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, <clears throat> saw a lot of action saw a lot of combat. And uh, those are the three people that I really want to talk about. They're three commanders that I saw in action. Some of them as young men, some of them again as, as senior commanders. Uh, like I said, they were shaped by the experience in Vietnam. I, I look at the Persian Gulf War and, and I viewed it as a graduation ceremony for the junior officers of the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Navy in Vietnam. Uh, they, they had been cannon fodder and did not want to be the author of making their soldiers cannon fodder in another war. So we fought Desert Shield and Desert Storm 
the smart way. Uh, there was no rotation home. Uh, the terms of your service in that deployment was you go home when you win the war, when it's over and done, not before. Uh, there's no sending units out there at 80% of their strength with brand new lieutenants uh, who don't know what they're doing. Uh, they went with strength at 110 to 120%. And uh, they went ready to fight this fight that enemy and when it was finally kicked off a 100 hour war and uh, the u.s troops cut through the enemy lines like a hot knife through cold butter uh, i i can recall in the lead up a lot of frightened stories. Uh, Dave Hackworth wrote a piece predicting that that thousands of Americans were going to die attacking uh, flaming oil trenches in Kuwait. <coughs> I knew better. Uh, I deployed to uh, Riyadh. Uh, for the second time in January, in the lead up to the invasion. And uh, I had been there a few days. The uh, military press management was hideously bad. Uh, they weren't letting the reporters cover anything but a one hour command briefing once a day in Riyadh and uh, there were about 400 reporters in Riyadh and another thousand over in Dharan who were not really covering anything and uh, the worst thing you can do is leave a bunch of reporters with nothing to do. Uh, I put in a dozen requests to cover you know, a B-52 strike out of, uh, out of uh, uh, Diego Garcia to go spend a night with a <clears throat> Patriot battery, <coughs> everything I could think of, and nothing happened. No response at all. They, they, they would laugh and drop them into their desk drawer. <clears throat> so one night, we were up all night with uh, scud attacks and alarms and go to the basement and all that stuff. And finally, about eight o'clock in the morning, I got to lay down. I thought I'd get a few hours sleep. And my phone started ringing. And at each time, it was a different public affairs officer who had one of my requests in hand. And uh, he would say, we've got your request, sir, and we're working on it, and you'll be hearing from us. And then there'd be another one with another of my requests. And they went through all of them. And I thought, you know, this is really very strange. And then I get a call from the Navy captain who was Schwarzkopf's PAO. And he says, why didn't you tell me you knew the general? And I said, well, I know a lot of generals. I don't talk about it a lot. He said, well, he wants to see you at his, at his office at 11 o'clock. I'll escort you across the street. And he did. And we stepped into Schwarzkopf's office. And the first thing he did was throw the Navy captain and everybody else out of the office and close the door. And we sat down and uh, he reached over and he pulled the cover off his battle map. This is two weeks before G-Day. And he shows me what he is planning to do in this campaign. 
and I'm, you know, my jaw drops and my eyes bug. And uh, he says, uh, you know, the, the Marines uh, want to do a combat amphibious assault on the beaches of Kuwait. This is, you know, they want an Iwo Jima. And he said, I'm not going to let them do it. I nodded and uh, we talked for a while and, and he says, uh, I know you want to go with the first cab, but I got to tell you, they're going to be in Central Reserve and they may not get a whiff of this thing. I think it's going to be over pretty quick. He says, so I'm going to send you to the commander I have over here who is most like Hal Moore. And the division that has the most challenging and dangerous mission in my battle plan. And I said, Jesus, Dorm, I thought we were friends. And, uh, and he laughed and, and uh, he told me, I'm, I'm sending you to Major General Barry McCaffrey and the 24th Infantry Division, Mech. They're going to be my left hook out through the western Iraq desert and come out behind the enemy divisions. And uh, so he says, now what can I do? I said, well, you know, there are 400 reporters across the street in that hotel with nothing to do. And those are the most militarily illiterate bunch I have ever run across in my life. And I suggest that, that you try to bring them up to snuff. And uh, he said, how do I do that? I said, start war 101. You got to, uh, you've got to bring them, bring them up to speed. Bring in the world's leading expert on the M1A1 Abrams tank. Bring in the world's leading artillery expert on the firefinder radar. You know, one by one, give them two hours and, and teach them something so they don't screw this whole thing up. And, and Norm says, you know, I can do that. Well... Sure enough, next day they started War 101, and here was your Abrams guy, and here was your fire, firefinder radar. And on the third day, I'm sitting there, and the world's leading expert on marine combat amphibious assault landings is briefing on how you do those. He didn't say they were going to do one, but he said, this is how you would do it if you did it. Well, the next day, I, I just bit my tongue and said nothing. And uh, the next day, the front pages around the world and the evening news uh, was all about how the Marines were preparing to storm the beaches of Kuwait. And Saddam Hussein moved a division or two over to cover those beaches. And what you had there was a perfectly planned and conducted information war strike. And the reporters couldn't complain, didn't complain, because they were the ones who took the bait. Uh, and uh, it was it was an interesting operation. Uh, Schwarzkopf sent me down to the 24th Division, and there I I was introduced to Barry McCaffrey, and uh, he looked at me and he said, uh, "You know, I trust you because Schwarzkopf trusts you, but more than that, I trust you because you're coming with me." And uh, I, I took that to heart. Uh, and uh, I had to, 10 days or two weeks to go all over that division, brigade by brigade, artillery, the uh, LERP guys, uh, everybody 
and and take briefings and ask questions. And I would go back to my tent at night and sit down and write it up. I couldn't send the stories until we had crossed the berm and the war was on. But I stacked all that up and uh, finally the day came and, and I rolled off in a Humvee uh, with no back panel on it. So uh, we went across the Western desert eating the dirt kicked up by two columns of Abrams tanks, one 50 meters to the right and another 50 meters to the left. We ate a lot of dirt, but the PAO major back at, uh, back at the berm took, uh, took my copy over and put it on the casualty facts and sent it to my boss in uh, Washington, D.C. at uh, U.S. News. Uh, you know, they had put in effect a, a pool system, 10 pools of 10 journalists each, uh, but I was operating outside that with, uh, with Schwarzkopf's imprimatur. And uh, for the hundred hours of that campaign, the, the 24th Division PAO flew out every, every afternoon before sunset and uh, picked up any stories or photos that I wanted to, to have sent back to my office. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, after we got across the desert, and we loggered in for the night. I uh, I hooked up with McCaffrey and joined him in his Black Hawk command chopper, and for the rest of the war, flew with him from brigade to brigade to brigade as as we progressed uh, along. I think it was Highway 13. Uh, between Kuwait City and Baghdad. Uh, and uh, I was in McCaffrey's back pocket for the whole war. Uh, the, I have to tell you a story how, uh, I, I guess it was on the second day and we had dropped in on one of his brigades and he took a briefing and he gave them orders and they saddled up and moved off. And there we sat in his chopper, probably six of us, maybe seven, including the crew. And uh, McCaffrey had him set up the comms, the satellite dish and uh, and he wanted to talk to his higher headquarters and uh, it didn't work. And uh, he exploded. He started eating everybody in that little tent hanging off of the command chopper. And I thought this would be a good time to go out about 30 meters to a pile of rocks and sit down and wait for the storm to blow over. And uh, McCaffrey ate everybody in that little tent. And then he came out and he started yelling at me. And I said, I don't work for you. You can't yell at me. <laughs> and he, he broke out laughing and turned around and went back inside the little tent. Uh, it was a, a fascinating campaign. It's, it ended too soon. The White House called a stop at 100 hours and uh, the plan was for 144 hours and, and uh, we could have used that 44 hours. Fred Franks could have used it. Uh, Barry McCaffrey could have used it. When they called the ceasefire at 3 a.m. on the third day, I guess it was, we were about to launch an attack forward into Basra. Uh, 
we we had drugged 30,000 men across the western Iraq desert for 250 miles in that one division. We had 15 battalions of 155 and 105 artillery, and it was all lined up, ready to shoot the prep, and we were ready to go, and they said, stop. It's, uh, we've got a ceasefire at 700, oh, 0700 hours, and uh, you can't go. And uh, I'd been snoozing under the helicopter, and McCaffrey came around, and he kicked me in the ribs, and he said, get up, Joe, it's all over. And I said, what? He, I said, you mean we, we brought all of this this far, and we can't use it? He said, well, we can't attack, but they didn't tell me I couldn't use the artillery, so we're going we're gonna to shoot them up here in about a half hour. And he and I stood there, and uh, half an hour later, all of that artillery opened up. It was like a summer thunderstorm, but it was 180 degrees from horizon to horizon. It just fired it up, and, and McCaffrey was standing there saying, I'm five clicks too short. I'm five clicks too short. And I said, too short for what? He said, the Rumila oil refinery, if I was five clicks closer, we could set that sucker on fire. But we didn't get that done. Uh, Schwarzkopf uh, took me around as he was making his last preparatory visits to the various participants in this campaign on the eve of Desert Storm. And uh, we flew around uh, Saudi Arabia for uh, two days in his plane, uh, taking briefings from the logistics people and all of the various commands. And uh, and I would interview him on the plane in between these stops. And uh, he, he is a fascinating guy, Schwarzkopf. McCaffrey's a fascinating guy. But the one guy that I know best and I knew longest, 52 years we were best friends, was Hal Moore. First as a lieutenant colonel, then as a colonel, then as a brigadier, major, and lieutenant general. Uh, we co-authored two books together. Uh, no, no closer thing than marriage co-authoring. You, you really have to trust the guy you're working with. Uh, and I trusted him implicitly and vice versa. Uh, I'm reminded that we were working out the contract with Random House for publication of, uh, of We Were Soldiers Once and Young. <clears throat> and uh, we were having a sit down with our new literary agent, a, a lawyer in Washington, D.C. named Bob Barnett who represented a lot of TV guys in and, and, and their contract negotiations. And since they also wrote books, he, he became very good at working out book contracts. So he agreed to take us on. We're sitting there and he looks up, Barnett does, and he says, uh, I, I need to see the contract between you two. And I looked at Hal, and Hal looked at me, and we both shrugged. And Hal said, uh, I don't think you understand. Uh, uh, we don't have a contract. We, we shook hands. Uh, and the lawyer looked horrified. 
And Hal said, what you need to know is that we have trusted each other with our lives in combat. And this is just a little matter of some money. And that was how it was. That was how it was between me and Hal Moore. We had trusted each other with our lives in combat. And we were closer than brothers for all the rest of our lives. Uh, I would say from close observation <clears throat> that Hal Moore was the finest battlefield commander at battalion and brigade level that I ever saw in 40 plus years of going to war all around the world. Uh, absolutely superb, instinctive commander. Uh, Moore was a voracious reader. He read history. He read especially military history. Uh, his idea of a good weekend was to take the maps and the journals and go out to an old battlefield and walk it, looking at the map, reading the journal, trying to figure how he would have made the decisions that this general made that worked well or worked terribly or cost the lives of thousands of men. Uh, when he got on the boat going to Vietnam as a battalion commander, he had a footlocker full of books on the Indochina War, on the history of, of Indochina. Uh, all of the stuff he needed to read, he had and he read and he learned from it. But he also said, you know, you have to follow your instincts. Your instincts are the summation of your education, your reading and study, uh, your observation of the world you live in, and in the end, if your gut is telling you one thing and your brain or the rule book is telling you another, go with your gut. Uh, and I watched Hal make instinctive decisions during the battle that uh, I was astounded. Uh, he would order the movement of a platoon or a company into a slot on the perimeter, and 10 minutes later, the enemy would attack precisely that point, which had been uncovered until he moved those troops. Uh, he, he was forced to take gambles uh, on the first day, uh, it took over five and a half hours for him to get his battalion on the ground as they were under attack from the enemy. And what that meant was that he protected the, the half of the LZ perimeter that faced the mountain. And he left the back half wide open. He, he had no choice. Uh, and thank God it worked. By the time he managed to start filling in, the other thing was that the lost platoon, they got cut off exactly in the middle of the route that led to the back of the LZ. And, and they stuck it out there for 26 hours overnight. Uh, half of them were dead, a quarter of them alive but wounded, but they fought. They fought and they blocked the enemy attack 
headed for the unprotected rear of the perimeter. Uh, the, the reason they got out there 150 meters from the perimeter uh, was the screw up of a, an over aggressive second lieutenant platoon leader who uh, he was told to move up and lock in on the right flank of Bravo Company, first of the seventh on the perimeter. And instead, as he uh, reached that position, he spotted a couple of North Vietnamese uniformed who ran. And he took off running after them with his whole platoon following. And they ran out there until they ran into the ambush. And the lieutenant was killed, and the first sergeant was killed, and the mortar sergeant was killed, and a three stripe buck sergeant named Ernie Savage took command of what was left of that platoon. Nine of them were dead, uh, six or eight wounded five or six unwounded and he redistributed ammo and he called in the artillery he did everything that you needed to do and he did it right and somehow they survived repeated enemy attacks and after it was all over i said if that lieutenant had lived hal what would you have done? He said, well, he said it had a tough decision. Uh, you know, my first impulse would be to court-martial him for violating orders. And on the other hand, I'd be tempted to give him a silver star for having stopped the, that enemy from overrunning us in the rear. So... Uh, there's that, the fog of war, unintended consequences. Uh, what I would say about Hal Moore as a commander is that he had a deep and abiding love for his troops. He didn't forget them when he left that command. He didn't forget them for the rest of his life. Uh, I, he and I, I'll tell you a story. We were at Fort Hood and we had been scheduled to make a talk to the officers and NCOs of the 1st of the 7th Cavalry, active duty. And it was gonna be at breakfast at the mess hall. And we got there and there was a line coming out the door, soldiers, and then going halfway down the block. And we stood there and the battalion commander said, come with me, we'll go to the head of the line. And Hal Morse dug his heels in. He said, no, sir. He said, I, I don't get in line ahead of soldiers. And the commander says, but, but sir, if you don't, we're going to run out of time for your talk. He said, that's too bad, son. You need to organize your mess hall so they feed your troops a lot more expeditiously. Meanwhile, Joe and I are going to the end of the line and we'll wait there. And that's what we did. Uh, more long after he retired, was invited to go to Russia and uh, to do a mountain climbing expedition with a bunch of former Spetsnaz Special Forces Russian Army veterans who had fought in Afghanistan. And uh, Hal goes along. First day they're up in the mountains and uh, he uh, 
He won't eat until everybody else has eaten. He won't pitch his tent until everyone else's tent is pitched. And this went on for a few days, and finally one of these one of these really hard bitten Russian troops veterans gets the interpreter and comes up and he said, uh, General Moore, you are unlike any general that we have ever seen in the Red Army. You you take care of us. Our generals don't do that. They could care less. But you, you care. You, you take care of us first. And we see that and we love that. Uh, that was Hal Moore. That was the way he operated. And that's the way he expected his officers to operate and his NCOs. Uh, take care of the troops. He lectured at West Point a few years before his death. And uh, it was uh, a revelation of sorts. They had Eisenhower Hall cram full. And uh, he's up there talking about combat leadership. And someone asked him, what is the most important principle of leadership? And he looked at that audience and he said, it's love. And, you know, the jaws dropped, especially in the front row with all of the senior officers and professors. And Hal said, it's love. You must love what you are doing, leading soldiers. You must love those soldiers. If you don't, go find some other line of work, sell insurance or whatever, but don't be an officer and a leader of troops unless you can love them. And he said, you must love them more than yourself. You must take care of their needs ahead of your own. See that they are fed and sheltered and that they get their mail before you take anything. And if you take care of them, they'll take care of your career. You don't have to worry about it. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And uh, Tim, if you will you come back up, we can uh, do some questions. Absolutely, Joe. On behalf of, of everyone, thank you so much. And, and uh, let's take some questions. I've got... Uh, I'm going to start with one because uh, I, I love the story. You and I have had the opportunity to speak about it, but you you told me, you described to me, of course, we saw it in the movie, you read it in the book, but you told me about your first meeting with uh, Hal Moore, Colonel Moore, at, at, as you were preparing, and it's a great story. Would you share with the group uh, how that meeting occurred uh, there in Vietnam? About three days before the fight at X-Ray, I hooked up with Hal Moore's battalion at Play Me Special Forces Camp. And for some ungodly reason, he had been ordered to take the battalion out to the south of Play Me and do a god awful hot walk in the sun up the mountains in the opposite direction from where the intel said the enemy was. I don't know why, and Hal didn't know why, but off we went, and uh, we were up in the mountains at about 4,000 feet, and we went into uh, a, uh, 
a village of mountain yards and uh, you know, an old man came out to one of those stilt houses on the porch. He was buttoning an old French army tunic and waving the tricolor flag. He thought his old buddies from France had come back. Uh, we took off, we did a med cap in that village and then we took off and I hadn't talked to Moore at this point or the Sergeant Major. I was just staggering along and uh, we made our way through some bamboo and wait a minute vines that, you know, you'd be good doing good to make a hundred meters in an hour with two guys chopping a path. And right before dark, we forded a neck deep mountain stream, coldest water imaginable and we pull into a perimeter and we start digging our foxholes and we're soaking wet and the sun goes down and it is cold up there. It's, I swear to God, I was colder on that plateau that night than I ever was in Moscow at 55 below zero. And uh, I shivered and shook all night long. And finally in the morning, I, uh, I, this, there was a little bit of light at the horizon. And so I get out some C4 and I'm gonna boil some coffee water and I get my canteen cup and you know, 40 seconds of C4 and you got boiling water and I'm just about to pour the powdered coffee in there and I look up and there's four boots on the edge of my hole in the ground and two of them belong to Hal Moore and two of them belong to Sergeant Major Plumley. And Moore leans forward and he looks at my cup of hot water and he says, you're no son in my battalion. We shave in the morning. We, we try to look fairly decent, even in combat. And <laughs> the sergeant major's giggling. And I look at my hot water and I repurpose it to shave with. And that was my introduction to Hal Moore. But he noticed something. He noticed I was carrying an M16 on my shoulder. Later, he would say Galloway had the sharpest pencil of any reporter he ever met. And three days later, I'm trying desperately to get into landing zone x-ray and I can't get a ride. And there are five or six other reporters, including my nemesis, Peter Arnett of the AP, already there, also trying to get in but I have an ace in the hole. I've marched with the battalion and I recognize Captain Matt Dillon Moore's S3 rushing by and I grab him. I said, Matt, I need to get in there and I'm not having any luck. He says, well, I'm taking two helicopters full of ammo and some water in as soon as the sun goes down. I said, good, I want to go. He says, I can't take you unless the old man says so. I said, let's get him on the radio. And we go to GP medium, which is battalion rear. And uh, he gets more on the horn and you can hear the battle in the background. And he reports that he's bringing in two choppers full of ammo and water. And he's bringing the artillery LNO and He's bringing this guy and that guy. And oh, by the way, that reporter Galloway wants to come with me. And Hal Moore over the rattle of musketry says, if he's crazy enough to want to come in here and you got room, bring him. Because Hal Moore believed that the American people had a right to know what the army was doing with their sons in combat. He believed that there was a place for reporters on the battlefield. 
His rules were fairly simple. Don't get in the way. Uh, and his rules to his troops were speak from your own level. Don't answer questions that General Westmoreland ought to be answering. Uh, and with those simple rules, uh, the battlefield was open to media coverage and Moore had no problem with that. Thank, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, here's a couple more questions. Um, and you spoke about going in in the Gulf War with, with um, speaking with Schwarzkopf and sort of been, and, and, and sort of was given the inside baseball. Uh, one person attending wants to know, how did you feel about being privy to the strategic information like that? And in and, and, and the early part of your career, uh, being in proximity to uh, command officers, especially, especially in the early part of your career. So what did it feel like to be privy to that information and, and to have access to that level of uh, provider? Uh, I would tell you one thing. Nobody, of none of my colleagues or competitors saw anything wrong with it. They understood. If it had been offered to them, they would have taken it. Uh, I saw nothing wrong with it. What, what I have to say is that, that I earned that level of trust by 30 years of straight shooting when it come to reporting military affairs. And I have lectured at journalism schools and colleges over the years and I tell them don't think you can walk on a military base and and find a scandal and earn a Pulitzer Prize uh, go in the gate shoot straight deal honestly and the word will pass the professional Officer Corps has remarkably good, fast communications. If you screw one of them, you've screwed them all. If you treat one of them honestly and decently and quote him accurately, that word passes just as fast. And so this is how you deal with the military. And I tell them, the truth is I feel more comfortable at the base of the flagpole than anywhere else. That's a wonderful quote, Joe. A couple of more questions, if it's okay, if you have a, a few more minutes. Sure. Uh, the um, one, one here from, from an attendee says, did you ever have a chance to go back uh, to Vietnam, particularly with Colonel Moore, with Al Moore? And what was it like for you to go back and 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 specifically what when you were there what memories came back to you uh hal and i went back five or six times uh in the beginning doing research and interviews for for uh the book we were soldiers once and young and uh it you know it Nothing happens fast in Vietnam with a communist government. Uh, it was a fight to get in. It was a fight to get what we wanted. Took two trips before they gave us interviews with uh, uh, General uh, Wen Hu An, who was Hal's opposite number at, at X-Ray. Uh, General Chu Hui Man, who was the division commander across the border from X-Ray. Uh, we had three interviews with General Vo Win Jop, the head of the whole operation. And uh, finally, I think it was our second trip. They agreed the book had come out and they noticed that we quoted them fairly and honestly in the book. And so they said, come back and we will give you 
what you asked for, which is a trip back to the battlefield. And we did that. And we went in company with General Lon and three of his colonels who had been company commanders at X-Ray. <clears throat> and uh, we were on a little bus with those guys from Huey to Da Nang to Nha Trang to Pleiku. And then Pleiku, uh, we had an ABC film crew, thank God, and they were paying to charter a Russian hind helicopter to fly us into uh, landing zone x-ray. And <clears throat> we went to the battlefield in company with these enemy commanders who had done their best to kill us all there. But in the course of bouncing around on that little bus, we noticed something. We had a lot in common with those guys. Uh, Moore and I discussed this at length and decided, you know, after a fashion, we're blood brothers. We shed their blood, they shed ours. We fought for our country, did our duty the best we could, so did they. Moore and General Lon sat there and with a piece of paper worked out how similar their careers were in terms of education, in terms of junior command, how Moore as a captain was a company commander in Korean War, fought on Porkchop Hill in Old Baldy. General An as a captain commanded a company in the attack on Dien Bien Phu. Uh, you know, and they, they, their careers were stair-stepped like that. And, uh, but we ended up leaving on after that trip. We, during that trip, Hal and I and a couple of the guys were left behind at landing zone x-ray. The helicopter flew off with everybody except us and then couldn't come back. There was a monsoon rainstorm and then it was dark. And we spent the night there. And while we were out there, General Lon was trying to order that helicopter crew to fly back out for us. And they were saying, hell no, we can't do that. We don't fly night. And uh, on called Hanoi to try to get the defense ministry to order that helicopter to go get us. And Hanoi said, wait a minute, are you telling us that you've got an American general and a famous writer and a TV film crew stranded out there five clicks from the Cambodian border in the Khmer Rouge? Oh, they said, General On, if anything happens to those guys, something bad is going to happen to you. And On walked that floor all night long worrying about us. Now, that from a guy who tried his best to kill us. We did, uh, we did trips, and if you're interested in it, that whole thing, I suggest you read We Are Soldiers Still, which is the story of our journey back to the battlefield. And it's got, it's got all of that detail and a lot more in the book. Thank you, Joe. That You'd be uh, proud to know that, that there are a lot of, uh, of questions here and, 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 and to all of you who we didn't get to uh, answer them because of time, I will tell you that uh, I will work with Mike Perry and we'll see if we can collect these questions and, and work to get you individual answers if we have your contact information. I will want to uh, tell you that I'd, I'd like to end uh, by telling you, several of you asked questions about the movie about uh, uh, Sergeant Major Plumley, which I know 
uh, having spent some time with Joe, he's going to love to talk about. So I'll encourage you to come next week when Joe's talking about books and movies, and, and he'll talk about how accurately betrayed Hollywood is, is doing with, with some of these soldiers and, and stories. Um, before we go, though, uh, would you, Joe, tell us just a little bit about your new book and hold up the copy so we can see it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the book is called They Were Soldiers, the sacrifices and contributions of our Vietnam veterans. Uh, it is profiles and interviews with 49 Vietnam veterans from Colin Powell to Fred Smith to Diane Carlson, Evan, the Army nurse, uh, guys you never heard of, focuses less on the war they fought and more on they have lived and the good they have done for our communities and our country since that war. And uh, it's long overdue. Uh, you know, I've been giving speeches for years. And what I like to say is those kids I went to war with in Vietnam may not be the greatest generation, but by God, they were the greatest of their generation. And so here is that book, and it will it is now available pre-order on Amazon.com. And uh, we'll talk more about it next week uh, and about the movies as well. And uh, Thank you all for tuning in. I'm sorry we can't get to all the questions. Well, the good news, Joe, is I found out that we are going to be able to copy the questions down. And so uh, with your permission, we'll sort through them and, and, and see if you have time in your busy schedule to answer a couple of them. And we'll get back to the, to the attendees with, with direct answers from you. Very good. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.